We are here today with Dr. Christopher Newfield from University of California at Santa Barbara. Thank you for taking time to be here with us, Chris. It's great to be here with you. Um, we have asked you to join us today because of your work in critical university studies, and we have a few questions we would like to ask you about. So the first one is, what do you see as key trends in higher education reforms or transformation around the world? Okay, well, there's a couple of things that are happening right now that don't line up. One is that all around the world, societies realize that we need tertiary education now. We need to get people through college and not just through high school. So there's an interest in mass higher education. What conflicts with that is our efforts to do it on the cheap, you know, to make mm -hmm. it as inexpensive as possible to those societies, to think more about cost than about quality. So on the one hand, we're letting more and more people in, attracting more and more people in. And on the other hand, we're not really supporting them with the quality that we took for granted during the period after World War II. So I'm actually quite worried about the second thing, that we're, we're getting access, but we're not getting quality at the same time. Mm -hmm. But do you figure that these transformation, massification, as you said, in, mm -hmm. is it more of a um, political or discursive ideational created problem, or is it a real problem of public finance? Well, that's a good question. Uh, sometimes it's real. I mean, there are a lot of uh, middle and low-income countries that can't just throw money at college. I mean, many places that are still interested in improving the quality of primary and secondary education. But in wealthy countries like this one that we're in, or the US or the UK, et cetera, it's not really a question of money. It's a question mm. of priorities. People are, you know, they're, they're spending money on other things, including, you know, tax expenditures, et cetera, and not so much on making sure that we get access and quality at the same time. I mean, the, the example that, I, that always comes to my mind, not because I'm such a huge sports fan, but because I've always kind of admired the way that teams train, is that it's unimaginable to have even a high school football team, or certainly not a college football team, that you know meets for an hour and 15 minutes twice a week, where the training is completely unsupervised, where you don't you know you don't really nobody really knows what it is that you're doing. There's no attempt to make the members of the class fit together in the way that it works in a team, and yet that's what we're doing in college. Hmm. And the tendency hmm. now, in order to save money, is to make that even more common. That is to have less contact time between you know, teachers and students, to have students work more on their own. The introduction of online education mm. is part of that, where you're basically in you know, your computer at home, not interacting with teachers and other students. So what I would like to see is universities that take education, the quality of education, as seriously as they take the quality of their sports teams. Mm -hmm. We're here in New Zealand, which is a particular case, and you're from the United States, from California. Is there, are there particular changes happening in the United States uh, that line up with what you were just talking about, or, or specifically in the University of California system? Well, I think that because of public, we're having public funding cuts. We've had 30 years of them. They're not tied to the financial crisis. They predated that. Whenever there's a downturn, there's a cut in public funding and a, a corresponding increase in tuition costs. So there's been a policy for 30 years of shifting the cost of this public good, you know, higher education, which benefits the whole society and not just the individual, onto the backs of students and their families uh, and away from the general public that is also benefiting. Mm -hmm. uh, I th as I understand it, I'm not an expert on New Zealand, but I think New Zealand is further down this same road in a couple of ways, not so much in charging as mm -hmm. much as we do. The U.S. is kind of the top of the list in terms of our fees, but in seeing uh, the university as a sort of a, a education as a commodity, um, as a universities as businesses, you know, where you can do research and then hand it off to the private sector and make money off of basic research and so on. So I, I think that really the, the world is converging around, uh, or has converged over the last 30 years around a market model, mm -hmm. which in my view is not compatible with the human development model that I see higher ed is really based in. Mm -hmm. How are students reacting to this? Do you, do you notice changes in the classroom and in your interaction with students? Do they, do they see these changes? And, and what well, do they in, in California, tuition was 
three thousand U.S. dollars a year mm -hmm. in two thousand, and now it's three times higher. And for out-of-state students, it's three times higher than that. So students that come, say, from New Zealand, it also applies to international students, to California are paying between fifty and sixty thousand U.S. Mm -hmm. dollars a year for total cost of attendance. So there's more anxiety, there's more stress, there's more of a desire to show short-term benefits for higher, higher education on the part of students, even though I don't think that's really where their hearts are. I think most students' hearts are towards getting skills, getting connected to the larger world, developing their powers of creativity and curiosity. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't really learn that from me. They come to the university mm -hmm. with that. And then one of the things that a, a more short-term university does that's on a tighter financial leash is beat that out of them. You know, we teach them, no, no, you can't be long-term. You yeah. should be more short-term, too, just like we have become because of the financial pressures that we're under. Yeah. Is there any kind of, uh, is there a contradiction there? Is it possible to, to give hundreds of thousands, if not millions of students, that kind of university experience um, that, that may have been more popular 20, 30, 40 years ago, or may it not more popular, but kind of the, the way that university education was framed? Is yes, I mean, there's, I mean, there's a couple of things. One is it was great for our parents and grandparents, so why isn't it good for today's students? Mm -hmm. There's no explanation for that. Mm -hmm. It's to me just kind of older, wealthier people not wanting to pay for poorer, younger people. And that's kind of how it's working in California. I just think that's quite unfair, yeah. uh, selfish, really. And then as, um, the second issue, you know, it comes from out of, really out of my own family. You know, can anyone benefit from this? Should everyone benefit from this? And my answer is yes, based on what I saw with my own parents. My parents are first generation university. They're the, also the only people in their generations that went to university. They were able to do it in California in the 1940s and 50s because it was essentially free. You know, they came from sort of lower middle class backgrounds and their parents didn't have a lot of money to pay fees for that, but they didn't have to. And it completely changed their lives. My father went from being essentially on a mechanical track to becoming a doctor. And it doesn't mean that he necessarily did more good in the world by not working on mm. cars and working on bodies, but it also meant as part of the education that he got, he had a, a, a different understanding of societies, the world, human health, um, how different parts of societies fit together. Mm -hmm. And my mother just completely transformed her. I mean, she went to college to become a school teacher. And at the same time, she was obligated, because it was a liberal arts four-year degree that she was getting, to read Dostoevsky and Tolstoy and, and take art lessons, which she was terrible at, but she nonetheless had some experience with, with doing that with craft, and she's had an appreciation, she's now 85 years old, for imagination, for art, for creativity, for looking at things differently, for understanding how different cultures think and that it's legitimate what they're doing and it's not just you know, coming out of her own background that should be projected on the world. I mean, it's really why, how could we not give that kind of you know, enlarging understanding to everybody. Mm -hmm. Why should it just be for 2% of, of any country's population? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So until now we have mainly discussed that the broad transformations of higher education around the world have to do with market model mm -hmm. of how universities are organized and governed or imagined um, in connection with this massified inflow of increased student numbers which presupposes other reforms and consequences for universities as well. But nevertheless, in your estimation, are there any positive elements coming out of these dynamics around the world? Well, I think that any organization can learn from any other organization. So universities can learn from industry, from businesses. There's no question. In what respect? Well, there's certain kinds of um, you know, organizational effectiveness that have been tried out on large scales in, in companies. Uh, in terms of the process of learning, we are the experts. Mm -hmm. And what's happened under austerity in various countries is that that expertise has been overshadowed by sort of by first financial operations and then management operations and then development and 
outside relationship observations. So we've, and in the U.S. we call it mission creep. We've lost our focus on the core of research and teaching. Uh, administrators are, are distracted because they have no choice. They're doing donor cultivation. They're doing political organizing of various kinds, political relationships, rather than developing you know, the business, the university business, which is really is teaching, learning, mm. research, the production of knowledge, and the dissemination of knowledge. So I mean, I guess the, there's a couple of good things. There is more interaction among people in different sectors. That's positive. And the second thing is that there's more general awareness of the value of knowledge, not only in the human terms I've just been emphasizing, but also in financial terms. So societies, governments, and business leaders are very interested in yes. the health of their universities. But I think that only there's a, a kind of an enlightened minority within government and industry are willing to let the university be the university and trust the internal expertise, students, faculty, administrators, staff working together to make that mm -hmm. effective. And there's, you know, there's been too much micromanaging and mm -hmm. meddling and so a lot of fundamental misconceptions about mm -hmm. uh, how the university works. So what I would like to see as a result of this general social awareness of the importance of the university is a little bit more, um, you know, good fences make good neighbors and letting Mm -hmm. different sectors develop in the way that is natural and um, self-directed within those sectors. Yeah. You mentioned austerity quite a bit um, in what you said uh, by now um, and indeed this is the fact that quite a lot of universities around the world are facing. So can you tell us a bit more about um, your recent thinking about unsustainability of austerity measures in higher education? If I'm not mistaken, you wrote about this not that long ago. Universities do not make money, they lose money. Mm. Scientific research loses money, and this is not well understood. Many administrators, many politicians think that if you that you can see basic research as an investment that even you that you can see applied research the next stage as an investment that's going to give you returns back to the university mm. it's not true every once in a while a patent some intellectual property that's owned by a university in the US it's really the top 15 or so out of the yeah. 4000 universities that we have that they make huge amounts of money you know if you owned a piece of google in you know, 1997, you are gonna put some money in your endowment. That's extremely rare. So there's, I think that the higher education, I mean, there's a lot of you know, data out there about this that's not in the, so much in part of the public discourse. P we should see universities as important social goods that lose money within their own structures, but that produce massive value, sometimes called yeah. spillover value by economists, for the society as a whole that isn't quantifiable in the same way that you can quantify revenues in manufacturing mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. regular services. Mm -hmm. You said there was an appreciation of knowledge as one of the positive outcomes, but I wonder sometimes if it's an appreciation of this abstract notion of knowledge mm -hmm. as this kind of disembodied thing other than mm -hmm. kind of knowledge embodied in enlightened students or enlightened people. Mm -hmm. Is that part of the, the challenge of yes. economizing the university? Yeah, like the, the first thing I mentioned is a negative trend is the potential dumbing down of education in order to save money. Mm -hmm. But the flip side of it is what you just said, that it, because of the um, sort of the MOOC way of massive open online courses in the U.S. and interest in online technology in 2012 and 2013, there is more awareness of the importance of teaching than was before. And embodied is actually a great way of putting it, Chris. Knowledge is, you know, it's in people's capabilities, in their individual capabilities, and in their group capabilities. One of the great things about working in a university is watching the transformation in people, old, young, as they learn and as they develop their ability to use what they've learned. And that's, you know, that's really the value that universities produce. It's not just it's not IP, it's not intellectual property in the abstract or a particular discovery, although those are important. Mm -hmm. It's this kind of creating this enlightened ensemble mm -hmm. that I, you know, I personally think is part of the you know, march of human history, that you, yeah. we can't actually move forward if we don't 
see education as that fundamental human function or activity that then makes us capable next year of things that we can't do this year. A very good point. This, and this sounds a lot like the last question yeah. I think we wanted to ask you um, is that you've done a lot of work as a, as a critical uh, literary scholar and we're wondering how a, how a reading of literature as a critic um, helps us understand higher education in general. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. It's Literature is um, it, where he, uh, individual life and society meet. One of the great things about fiction, also about poetry, drama, is you do this embodiment. You see forces of society affecting consciousness and human action. I, I see writing novels, reading them, you know, sort of the literary function as analogous to the educational function. You know, I mean, literally in the 19th century, people read novels in order to learn about what the outside world is like because there's no internet and there's no real travel. Mm -hmm. But I think that, that the modeling of the unfolding of a person's consciousness, which is often the plot line of fiction, uh, not just conflict with threatening forces, but just the, the emancipation of oneself from one's earlier limited self to, into this larger self is pretty much the same narrative arc that education has. Mm. So I think it's made me more appreciative than I was even in the beginning of the power of education. Mm -hmm. Professor Chris Newfield, thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank I you. I enjoyed this.